Hi, this is Brooke Hensley. And I'm Dana Sajid. And today we're going to talk about ultrasound guided subclavian central line placement. And once you're in the emergency department and you decide that you want to place a subclavian line, there are some anatomic considerations that you need to know about before you choose which side to approach. And on the right side, um, you actually have a lower pleural apex as compared to the left, so theoretically your risk of a pneumothorax is less on the right side but you have a higher rate of vessel trauma and also a higher rate of malposition. And the reason for that, if you look at this illustration below, you can see that if you approach the patient from the right side, from the subclavian vein, it actually has to take a very sharp turn to go down into the SBC. As compared to the left side, where it's more of a, a smooth transition. This is different than if you're taking the IJ approach from the right side where it's nearly a completely straight line, but from the right subclavian, it's much more difficult. Uh, on the left side, it's actually preferred for immediate cardiac access, such as a transvenous pacer or pulmonary artery catheter. So if you need, know the patient is going to go to the cath lab and they have to have a central line, uh, discuss that with your admitting team before you decide uh, where you're going to place the central line. Also, the thoracic duct is on the left side, so theoretically you have a higher uh, risk of trauma of that thoracic duct. All right, other things to consider, in general, subclavian lines have a lower risk of infection and thrombosis. They're preferred in TBI patients because of the theoretical venous outflow obstruction and contributing to increased ICP. Also, it's a larger vein and tends to remain patent in patients with shock. Also, Brooke, one other potential pro is that the subclavian vein is less susceptible to change in caliber and change in vessel size with patient positioning. So if you do have to keep someone with their head of bed slightly elevated, it won't affect the size of the vein you're about to cannulate as much as it would, for example, the IJ. Yeah, and we've definitely all experienced the frustration of a hypotensive patient and you're looking at the IJ or the femoral vein is just collapsing and it's an impossible target. So this is definitely um, a benefit of going with a subclavian approach. A con, however, is that you're unable to apply pressure because of that clavicle. So if somebody has a coagulopathy or they're bleeding and you have to apply pressure, if you accidentally cannulate the artery, it's definitely more difficult. You also have a greater risk of iatrogenic hemo and pneumothorax just because of the proximity to the lung. And traditionally you're unable to use ultrasound guidance so you have a risk, a higher risk of all of these complications but uh, today Dana and I are going to show you that it is possible. So we're going to talk about both the infraclavicular and supraclavicular approaches starting with the infraclavicular approach and this illustration here is just to remind you of the anatomy. And here, obviously, you have the clavicle and you have the subclavian vein underneath and as you go lateral, it turns into the axillary vein. And when you place the probe, you're going to be placing it just inferior to that clavicle. So when you actually go to cannulate that vein, it's more lateral than you normally would if you were using the landmark approach. So technically, this is called the axillary approach. Though that's of trivial consequence. It's the same vessel, just exactly. a little more lateral than the traditional blind Right. Blind We're placement. talking a difference of just a few centimeters, but if somebody, you know, wants to challenge you on that, it really doesn't matter. So the first thing you're going to want to do is get kind of orient yourself to the patient's anatomy. So you're going to take your linear probe and have it painting, uh, pointing towards the patient's head, and this is what you're going to see. You're going to see the vein, the artery, and this dotted line is uh, the pleural line. And you can see how scary, the how, why all these things are in such close proximity. And it's understandable why people try to avoid this area because of um, how everything is so close together. So if you turn your probe 90 degrees, you can 
see the long axis view of the vessels and here you see this pulsatile vascular structure and it looks very arterial but you should always confirm with doppler especially on a hypotensive patient it's not as easy to differentiate the artery from the vein here you have a very clear arterial waveform to confirm that this is the artery so if you fan a little bit you'll see the vein instead of the artery and you can confirm with doppler now, this is a venous waveform. It's a little bit pulsatile, which is expected because it's so close to the artery, but overall it's a venous waveform and you can confirm that that is indeed the vein. It's important to note how subtle a difference in probe positioning there is between the two. Um, it's really important that if you're using this for line placement that you keep your probe absolutely in this position. And that's one of the limitations of this long axis view is that it is very, very susceptible to great change in what your imaging is with the slightest movement of your probe or your hand. Right, it's much easier said than done. And here we have an example of the long axis approach where you can see the needle infiltrating lidocaine over the skin and soft tissues, but you can visualize the needle tip the entire way and uh, not infiltrating lidocaine into the vessel itself. This next clip is um, real-time visualization of the needle actually cannulating the vessel itself and knowing when to stop because you see how close that pleural line is. And the question is, what is better, the long axis view or the short axis view? And this is actually studied in, and published in the Journal of Critical Care Medicine recently in December 2014. And overall, the long axis view won where it was more efficient because you had decreased time to cannulation, fewer needle redirections that were required, and actually fewer posterior wall penetrations. And as Dana was saying earlier, it is much easier said than done, and it's very difficult sometimes to hold the probe completely still. Whichever method you choose to do, either short axis or long axis, you should always confirm your wire placement and um, you can place the probe in the long axis view and actually see uh, the visualization of the wire and confirm that it's actually nicely in the vessel, not going through the posterior wall and hitting the lung or going through the artery itself. The other thing you can do is if you've taken the time to prep both the neck and the subclavian area, you can actually look at the IJ and make sure that your wire hasn't curled up and gone the long the wrong direction because as you mentioned earlier there's a pretty sharp turn it has to take from the subclavian vein to get to the uh, brachiocephalic and to get to the SVC and sometimes a potential complication is that it the wire goes the wrong way so you can make sure you're not uh, gonna feed your line up into the neck instead of down into the heart. Yeah that's a great idea. So another approach is a supraclavicular approach and just to kind of get oriented with the anatomy you see the IJ the subclavian vein that form the brachiocephalic or the innominate vein. And here is the supraclavicular approach using the linear probe. And there are a couple ways to do this. Um, here they're using a very large linear probe. If you can find the smaller footprint linear probe, that's, that's even better. But there are a couple ways where you can find the right vessel. So, on the top right, this is your typical view of the IJ in the neck. And if you kind of get lost, you can just follow this IJ down until you see it meeting up with a subclavian vein to form the brachiocephalic vein. This is a still image of the subclavian vein. And if you can kind of imagine the, an extension of this image where the IJ meets the subclavian vein to form the brachiocephalic vein and then now you have a nice longitudinal image and you can go ahead and use your needle in real time and cannulate the vein. Another method is using the intracavitary probe. I'm a fan of this method. I like using the intra intracavitary probe for the uh, supraclavicular fossa there, especially for patients who are kind of thin and have a nice divot uh, next to their neck. It fits in very well, and it's still a high-frequency imaging probe, so it gives you very beautiful and clean images. 
one limitation is that the probe is a little bit bulkier and so you kind of have to grip it lower down in this region along the probe so you can hold it nice and still in the fossa with your non-dominant hand and then approach the vessel needle in plane with your dominant hand. Um, if you do have access to the small footprint probes, however, those fit very well above, uh, above the clavicle in most patients, and so that works great too. All right, so this recent journal article from 2014 shows a comparison of the supraclavicular and infraclavicular views for imaging the subclavian vein using ultrasound. And in this study, they enrolled about 100 patients that were going to get a central line using the subclavian vein. And they had the practitioners who were going to perform the procedure, survey the patient's anatomy, and rate the views that they got based on a Likert scale. And here are the results showing, uh, based on the four anatomic positions of this um, approaching the subclavian vein, uh, what percentage were rated good or excellent views. And the best views were from the right supraclavicular approach, showing 71.5% as being rated good or excellent. Then followed by the left supraclavicular, then left infraclavicular and right infraclavicular. Uh, future research will be required to see if this actually translates into successful central line placement. This study was just looking at the ultrasound imaging. And another potential benefit of coming from that supraclavicular approach, as you mentioned earlier also, is that it's a straight shot down into the, into the brachiocephalic, and you can really, uh, unlike the axillary where you have to travel a little bit and take a twist and a turn, this just, you point down, you go in, and it's in there. All right, so overall, just some take-home points. Know the indications and contraindications for placing a subclavian central line. Uh, know the different approaches for infraclavicular and supraclavicular approaches. Technically, the, in, the infraclavicular approach is, an act, is accessing the axillary vein, but it really doesn't matter. Uh, the long axis view is superior to short axis. Always confirm your anatomy with Doppler. And also confirm your wire placement prior to dilating the vessel. Please visit our website, and if you have any questions, please free to contact us. Thank you. Thank you.